It was a bald, wrinkled, almost blue head. Its eyes were huge and white, and as it looked at me, it had a smile from ear to ear that chilled my blood. Have you ever done urban explorations? You see, I'm not a YouTuber. I'm not interested in generating content from this, and I don't even want to become famous. I just enjoy getting into places where other people wouldn't go. To tell you the truth, I never believed in the paranormal, and that's not what I was looking for in these explorations. And that's why I can tell you this story, as I spent months thinking I had gone crazy. It all started on a camping day. I had planned to do an exploration of the forest. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was just going to spend the night in the woods. None of my friends could go, but I had no problem with that. It wasn't my first exploration alone, and it wasn't going to be my last one either. Or so I thought. I spent the whole day going deep into the heart of the forest. I didn't really know what I would find, but I knew that there were no animals too dangerous or anything like that, since I always investigated where I go. When I got deep enough into the forest, I noticed that it was starting to get dark. So I made my camp and set up camp in a part that I saw as fairly open and free of trees. I ate quickly and went to sleep when it was still quite early. As the sun was rising before 6 a.m., I wanted to get up early and with lots of energy. I closed my eyes slowly, and before I knew it, I was asleep. When I opened my eyes, I felt something was wrong. I'm not a deep sleeper, but I can sleep through the night if no one wakes me up. And that night, something woke me up. The night seemed normal and quiet, but something was wrong. Call it a feeling, experience, or whatever, but I knew someone was there. Looking out at the pasture in front of me, I watched as something moved unnaturally. The wind wasn't blowing and it didn't seem to be an animal. Someone was watching me. It's not the first time I've been in danger, but I've never encountered anything like this before. A stalker whose face or intentions I did not yet know was watching me. Faced with this discovery, I did the most logical thing I could think of. I grabbed my flashlight, a knife I had at my side, and went into the opposite direction to where the grass was moving. In that camp, I didn't have anything too expensive. I could go look for it the next day if there was anything left. In one swift move, I took off at high speed towards the pasture and started running as fast as I could. I didn't know exactly where we were, but I had a good idea of it. As I ran away, I could hear someone behind me chasing me, but the footsteps got lost little by little until they ended up disappearing. I walked a little more looking for a place to hide, and that's when it hit me. In front of me was an abandoned building under construction. It was strange for all the things outside. It looked like a hospital. But what was a hospital doing in the middle of nowhere? Why was it abandoned? Whatever the reason, it was a good hiding place from whoever was still walking near me, so I decided to go in and hide until I was sure this person wasn't following me anymore, or just that it would be daylight. Once inside, I realized that the place was fuller than I thought. Why would they leave a place like this half-built? I explored the abandoned hospital, trying to get as far into it as possible. I wasn't really afraid of what might be inside the hospital, but it was the man who was stalking me outside that really terrified me. Behind a closed double door, there were lights. How was this possible? How did the energy get here? Why was it coming? Where was I? I admit that curiosity got the better of me and I walked to the door. Once I opened it, I was met with a new surprise. Behind the closed door, there were no people, there were no guards, and they were not performing any experiments or anything I could expect. It was just a hallway with light. I walked a little inside this corridor, considering going into one of these doors to hide. If that person who was stalking me saw this place, he would surely think there were guards and would not want to enter. I walked in with a big smile thinking that the worst had already happened and that surely this person could not do anything, when something in front of me made me stop in my tracks and fall to the floor with fright. One of the doors to the lighted corridor was open. Behind that door, there was no light, just gloom. 
Normally, this would not be the striking thing. The whole hospital except that room was dark. What really surprised me was that behind that terrifying door, someone was peeking out. For a moment, I thought it might have been a guard. It could also be my stalker or a simple homeless person who was living in the hospital. But no, this was something much worse. I will never forget how I felt when my eyes came face to face with, with whatever that was. It was a bald, wrinkled, almost blue head. Its eyes were huge and white, and as it looked at me, it had a smile from ear to ear that chilled my blood. I didn't know what this was, and it was the most terrifying thing I had ever seen in my life. At that moment, the first thing you think of is to run. Run as fast as you can and leave it behind. Would you believe me if I told you that I didn't? In that situation, I was so scared that my body became totally paralyzed, falling to the floor in panic and possibly victim to whatever it was that was in front of me, looking at me very calmly. As if knowing that I could not move, that being came out the door and walked slowly down the hallway towards me. His body was tall, gangly, and skeletal. His bones seemed to be disproportionate and senseless but he still walked towards me without any problems. What struck me most was the way he walked. I'm still terrified thinking about it. This being, the steps of this being were irregular and difficult, as if it was suffering every step it took. It was strange. It was walking like any other person, but something about that walk seemed forced. It was as if that thing that was coming towards me was trying to walk trying to be human, trying to make me think that I could be calm because I had another human in front of me. Seeing something so horrible filled my body with energy, and instead of using it to fight this being, I used it to run. I ran and ran and ran. I was so desperate that I didn't realize that I was still in an abandoned place. Since I entered, my life never stopped being in danger. Not by ghosts, psychopaths, or accusers, but by myself. As I was escaping from the being in that hallway, I fell down the escape hatches and ended up on the floor below. My body hurt a lot, and it was impossible for me to get up. But even so, I made every effort humanly possible to get out of that area. To keep going down the stairs and get out of there as soon as possible. But it was no use. Because of the blow I had at that moment, it was impossible for me to keep my concentration enough to keep from fainting. And so, as I closed my eyes and saw something or someone crawling near me, my eyes were much heavier than before. And when I closed my eyes, I fainted. When I woke up, it was already daylight. My body hurt a lot, and I still had the wounds from falling off the ladder. I went back to check the area that was lit, but now, not only was there no light coming from under the door, but the door was locked with the chains. To tell the truth, it didn't bother me much either. Anyway, I had no plans to set foot in that area again. When I managed to escape, the first thing I did was to tell the police everything. Once I did, they all told me that what happened to me at the hospital was probably a lie, the results of my nerves being harassed. It could even be the development of a mental illness that made me hallucinate. Whatever it was, I was sure that what I saw there was real. What the police were able to discover was the information about the man who was following me. Apparently, he was an ex-convict who had escaped from prison. This man never planned to hurt me. But he surely would have, if necessary. Luckily, the police caught him a few meters after he ran into me as he just kept running in a straight line. I still wonder what happened that day. Honestly, the older I got, the blurrier the whole story became. Let this be a lesson. To remember, there are things beyond human understanding. Today, I'm afraid to go camping or to hospital. And I know that no one can judge me for it. The only thing I hope is that no other explorer ends up in that scary abandoned hospital again. Maybe I survived by being lucky, but who knows what that thing might do to the next person who walks in.
Hello everyone. We are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. In my 30 years as a doctor in this hospital, you can imagine that I have seen all kinds of things. Patients fighting for their lives and others who no longer wanted to live. I saw violent families demanding that we do something more to save their family members and people completely abandoned. Being a doctor is a difficult job and only experience prepares you to be one. But there was a time when nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. Something so strange and out of this world, I can't put into words. That day, I saw evil in its purest state right in its eyes, and it looked back at me. It all started with a patient who had arrived a few days before. She was in intensive care, getting better. The day she was brought in, she had a lot of bruises and fractures in her body. Initially, we thought she had suffered domestic violence, but she was not in a relationship, and when a neighbor told the police about the noises, they found her at home with the door closed, alone. Maybe when she woke up, she was going to give us the answers to so many questions that we had been developing during these days. At that time, I can't say that I was an experienced doctor. But with a little more than five years of experience, I could say that I knew my way around the hospital. And that's why I can say that one day when I was doing night rounds at the hospital, I saw something that I don't think many other doctors have seen. I was in the room of one of my patients when behind me, I had the strange sensation that someone had walked down the hallway. Hello, is somebody there? Hey. Did you see someone behind me? I'm the only doctor around. Lo he visto. Era un demonio. Te estaba mirando. Sorry, I don't speak Spanish. Eh, a demon. Demon behind. What? Did he just say there was a demon behind me? That was weird. The man only had a broken leg and even thought I understood half of what he said. We had a talk a few seconds ago and he seemed in his senses. Now, he just seemed bothered. Like he saw the face of the devil itself behind me. I have to admit, that really scared me. Demon, don't go. It was a demon. Red eyes and smile. Hey, take it easy. It could be a lost patient. I, I have to check it out. Be right back, okay? And just like that, I left my patient. I ran quickly to the door, but when I saw the hallway, it was empty. Maybe he was gone. It may seem illogical, but I felt that something bad was happening. It was something I couldn't see or put into words, but it was as real as anything you are seeing right now. The hallway filled with an almost gelid cold. I felt the urge to leave, but I couldn't do it. I felt that someone was in danger and that I had to do something. I started to walk down the hallway and the cold was getting more and more intense. I resisted my impulse to leave as fast as I can and kept walking until I reached the girl's room. Her door was open and her lights were on. I had a troubling feeling about her. I felt she was in danger so I tried to enter her room, but something didn't want me to. The door slammed violently in my face. Was that the wind? No, impossible. There are no windows open, and the whole movement was way too violent. I tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. The girl woke up screaming in terror. Her eyes were wide open. She began to inspect her surroundings, lost. Suddenly, she saw something that terrified her. What was there? I couldn't see a thing. The girl got out of bed and tried to run, but she didn't know she was in a cast, so she fell to the floor. Meanwhile, I was pounding on the door as hard as I could. It was as if the weak bedroom doors were suddenly reinforced. The woman crawled against the wall away from someone I couldn't see, but it was there. The girl began to feel pressure on her neck and stuck against the wall, she was floating. 
She was fighting for her life, fighting to breathe. From behind the door, I could see how her arms and legs were breaking on their own, and from one second to the next, her neck snapped. The girl fell lifeless to the floor. The door to her room opened, and I rushed in. I stared in disbelief at what had happened. She was dead. This wasn't an accident or suicide. Somebody actually killed her. This didn't make any sense, and I refused to believe that there was something paranormal happening. But suddenly, I felt someone behind me. When I turned around, I saw it. A black figure more than two meters tall was staring at me. Its body was slender but imposing, and its eyes were red with the most intense fire I had ever seen in my life. I closed my eyes in disbelief, and when I opened them again, there was no one there. At that moment, I felt someone grab me by the neck and throw me against the wall of the hallway. I tried to get up, but the invisible being kicked me in the face and started stepping on my face as if I were a cockroach. I stood up and ran as fast as I could. As I did so, I heard mocking laughter from behind me, slowly fading into the echo of the huge hospital. It was never determined what had happened to the girl. The footage had disappeared, and although I was a suspect for a short time, the police concluded that I had nothing to do with it. I never saw anything remotely paranormal in the hospital again, but there is not a night that goes by that I don't hear that laughter in the hospital. That mocking, provocative laugh sounds like a reminder that I couldn't save that girl that day. Have you ever been treated by a bad doctor? You know, those doctors who don't care about you? Those few doctors who are tired of people and just want to go home? Every time I think back to that day, I think that I would have preferred to be treated by one of these doctors. I would have preferred to see anyone other than the one I saw. It all started when I was 18 years old. It was a very immature time for me. I was too young and innocent to be able to fend for myself but too old and rebellious to let my parents interfere with my life. We went to the hospital for sinus infection, and when it was my turn to go to the doctor's office, I insisted on going in alone. When I entered the office, the doctor was waiting for me behind his desk. At that point, neither I nor my parents had seen the signs. We didn't notice that the doctor's voice signaling for the next patient to come in was different. We didn't notice that the previous patient had never left the office before I was called in. And we definitely didn't notice the doctor locked the door when I walked in. After entering, he asked me what was wrong with me, why I was there. He didn't look like a doctor. He was unalienated, nervous, and even seemed quite angry. His voice was impatient and shaky, but it felt like he was holding back the anger in his eyes. He told me to lie down on the bed. He grabbed one of those little sticks used to check the throat, but without warning, he shoved it in violently ah. into my nose. The man squeezed harder and harder as if amused by what he was doing. Scared, I pushed him away. Hey man, what's your problem, man? <laughs> Relax, young boy. I understand the procedure might be quite painful, but no mistakes, it is normal. That can't be normal. This is the first time I heard about this procedure. That is because this is a new procedure. Are you questioning a doctor, kid? Do you think you know more than me? I, I guess I don't. Sorry. I overreacted. That hurt it. Just go back to your seat. You will feel better after this. At that point, I should have left. I should have screamed. I saw his psychotic eyes. I saw his macabre smile, but still, I trusted him. I sat back down, asking him not to use those sticks anymore. He started massaging my forehead to see if it hurt, a typical sinusitis procedure to see if I had mucus on my forehead. Everything was starting to go normal, but the procedure the man was applying on my forehead was getting stronger and stronger. I begged him to stop, that it hurt, but he wouldn't. He just increased the pressure more and more, slowly directing it toward my eyes instead of my forehead. I tried to pull his hands away and kick him, but nothing worked. It was as if 
he was totally fixed on hurting me. I screamed as loud as I could, and with all of my strength, I gave him one last kick that threw him into a locker. Hey, what is happening? Open the door. What are you doing to our son? My parents were trying to ram the door without success, while I watched the doctor recovering from the impact. The locker was still closed, but the impact shook it a little, and blood began to flow from its openings. There was a corpse inside the locker. At my discovery, he just grinned even bigger, from ear to ear, and walked in my direction, pulling a scalpel out of his pocket. I heard more and more voices on the other side, but the door was very solid and would not open. The doctor was almost beside me. I had to do something. I gathered all the energy I had and tried to ram him, but it backfired as he gave me a violent blow that knocked me backwards. He just kept approaching me as if nothing had happened, with that terrifying and maniacal smile. What are you doing? You're not a doctor, are you? Why are you doing this to me? I may not be licensed, but I know my medicine. I may not have the best intentions, but I consider myself a doctor. <laughs> you know you came in here feeling bad. But when I'm done with you, you won't feel bad anymore. You won't feel <laughs> anything. <laughs> why? Why? You're asking me why? Because it's fucking funny. The blood, the pain that you trusted me. I'm having the time of my life. Once he said this, the men lunged at me with a scalpel. I had to think fast and did the only thing I could think of. I used all my energy to throw myself out of the second floor window. As I fell, I felt the glass cutting through my body, but I felt no pain, only adrenaline and fear. The fall took forever, and as I kept falling, I saw the psychopath behind me. He had also jumped? Maybe he was hallucinating. As soon as I reached the bottom, I only remember an impact and suddenly darkness. I woke up in the hospital bed with a broken leg. My parents received me crying and told me everything that happened. Once I jumped out the window, the man jumped behind me with an uncontrollable thirst for blood. Unfortunately for him, he fell very badly. And even though it wasn't that big of a fall, he didn't survive. When the police inspected the office, they found the body of the real doctor in the locker. That was not my doctor, but a patient who had taken his place. My leg may have recovered, but in my head, I could never get over what happened. Every time I go to the hospital, I'm terrified of who might treat me. That psychopath may be dead, but in my head, he is more alive than ever. People always laugh when I tell them I have sacrophobia. It's not a common phobia, so you probably haven't heard of it, but it's basically the fear of sweet things. Now, I know that sounds dumb, as why would someone be afraid of something as amazing as candy and chocolate? But after hearing about this gruesome experience, you too will think twice about shoving a piece of candy down your throat. I remember as a kid, I really loved sweets. I can't forget the first time I tasted a bright red lollipop, and to me, it tasted like the sweetest thing on earth. After that experience, I would hoard sweets in my mouth any chance I got. I literally became obsessed with them, as I'd take them after breakfast, after lunch, and after dinner. Even though I loved doing this, my mom wasn't too keen on it, as my oral hygiene was horrible and that led to numerous dentist visits. Due to the excessive amount of sugar I was taking in, it didn't take long before my teeth started to hurt, and I eventually started going to the dentist regularly. I really hated going to the dentist, and it wasn't because I was scared of them, no. It was because of the way my dentist, Mr. Dorian, treated me. The first time I met him, I knew something was wrong, as he had a really weird aura. I remember telling my mom, I really don't want to do this. And she told me, 
Well, if you didn't eat sweets all the time, Holly, we wouldn't have to be here. It didn't take long before Dr. Dorian walked up to me and my mom. I smiled at him, and when he saw my teeth, he looked at me with disgust. I didn't think much of it at first, but every time I went back, he always treated me the same way. He always had the same disgusted look on his face as he looked at me like I was a filthy thing and I irritated and dropped me off herself that day. And I remember screaming at her on the way there as I told her, There's something wrong with him, Mom. Can you please listen to me? But all my pleas fell on deaf ears as she still dropped me off. I remember going into Dr. Dorian's office and it was awfully quiet as no other people were there. I walked in to see Mr. Dorian standing in the middle of the room, waiting for me. As soon as I saw him, I knew something was wrong. Because remember how I said earlier that he always looked irritated every time he saw me? This time, he was eerily calm. Dr. Dorian then told me in a calm voice, You arrogant, unfixable child! You have no idea what you have. Not all of us are as lucky as you to have a complete set of teeth. And seeing as you don't care about them, I will take them away from you. I was taken aback and freaked out by the statement. And as I started to say, what do you mean? He lunged at me. Before I could move, his hands were around my throat. He violently threw me into a chair and my head hit something hard. I was paralyzed for a few seconds as I watched him strap my hands down before prying my mouth open with the mouth prop. I tried screaming, but with my mouth pried open with the mouth prop, I couldn't really make much sound. I watched him get out a hammer and a chisel that was wrapped in a bloody cloth. I remember him walking up to me and placing the chisel at the base of my incisors. He then screamed the words, Say goodbye to your precious teeth. And as the hammer connected to the base of the chisel, I felt immeasurable pain ripple through my jaw. I screamed as I felt a tooth roll down my tongue and into my throat. Dr. Dorian, who now had a psychotic look in his eye, I reached out to it, but my hands were still restrained. I knew that if I didn't do something, the psychopathic dentist would kill me by morbidly breaking all my teeth out. So I began to profusely pull at my restraints. It really hurt to struggle, but I continued to pull, and soon enough, I heard a little pop sound as I felt waves of pain ripple through my body. I had twisted my wrist, but I was free, and without thinking, I grabbed what seemed to be a scaler, and as he was about to use the hammer again... I shoved the tool deep into his neck. I can never forget the look in his eyes as I stabbed him. It didn't take long before he slumped to the floor, and I hurriedly began to free myself. As soon as I was free, I ran out of the corner, and I didn't stop till I was very far from it. I then started to search my pockets for my phone, and once I found it, I immediately called. I remember my mom holding my hand and telling me, it's going to be okay. After putting myself together, I eventually told them everything that happened. When I was done relaying the incident, I was curious as to what Dr. Dorian had against me, so I remember asking them, Do you guys know why he did this to me? The cops then proceeded to tell me all they had found out about Dr. Dorian throughout their investigation as they said, Miss Files stated he had periodontitis. It's also known as periodontal disease or gum disease. It's a terrible disease that causes all your teeth to fall out. Apparently, he had gotten it at a very young age, which led him to lose all his teeth, as he, too, had dental implants. Apparently, that's why he devoted his life to being a dentist and taking care of other people's teeth. But due to the severe trauma of losing his teeth as a child, he developed some severe mental issues, which led him to go overboard with the obsession of preserving teeth. As they spoke, things began to click in my head as I finally understood why Dr. Dorian acted that way whenever he saw my teeth. 
and why he was so adamant on fixing my bad oral hygiene. I also realized that he saw me as a spoiled and greedy kid, and even though I was, there was no excuse for what he did to me. The officer then continued with, This clinic has been closed down so that no one would ever experience what you went through. I then asked the cops, And what about Dr. Dorian? Is he all right? People don't know whether I killed him or if he's still alive. And in any way, I prefer that as the uncertainty. Let me keep a bit of my sanity. It's been seven years since this incident, and I haven't eaten any sweet treats like candy or chocolate ever since. To be honest, it's not that I don't want to, but every time I try to, I'm taken back there. I know I'll keep for the rest of my life. For the past seven months, I've been working at a local hospital. I live in a town that was made for a retirement community. So, we hardly have young people here, let alone kids. If you are not familiar with a retirement community town, it's basically a town established for people to settle down after retirement. Most of the people you will see around the town are elderly. And naturally, the hospital too is filled with elderly patients who are sick and need constant medical attention. Being a nurse was always my dream, but never in a million years did I expect myself to be a nurse in a hospital with so many old people. Recently, a new lady had been admitted to our hospital. She had been in and out of the hospital for the past several years. Given her age and her illness, the doctors have decided to admit her for a long time now. Her name is Mrs. Francine, and she is the sweetest woman you will ever meet. Although she has dementia, and trouble talking and remembering things, she always greets me with a lovely smile and a how are you doing, dear, every time I go to her hospital room to check on her. Sometimes when she is doing okay, she makes me sit beside her bed and she tells me stories about her kids and grandkids. It's very entertaining to listen to stories from the 50s and 80s. In our hospital, instead of having fixed staff for the day and the night shifts, we all rotate our shifts. This means once a week, each nurse and doctor will have to do the night shift. Truth be told, I do not hate the night shift. The quiet in the hospital is a bit weird, but apart from that, it's peaceful. All you must do is take a round after every two hours and make sure all the patients are comfortable and sleeping. Mrs. Francine has a corner room, which means she has a great view of the lake beside our hospital. Although she is old, she gets out of bed on her own and sits in a chair watching the lake through her window. Many a time, she did it at night, too. I always made sure that she was in bed at night. However, the other night when I was on my round, I saw an old man exiting Mrs. Francine's hospital room. The visiting hours had ended a long time before, and that old man just casually walked out of her room as if he had been doing it for ages. I immediately went into Mrs. Francine's room and found her awake with a smile on her face. Mrs. Francine, who was that man? I saw him just walk out of your room. Oh, dearie, it was my husband. He comes to visit me often. That's nice, Mrs. Francine, but would you mind asking him to come during the visiting hours? Oh, I sure will, my dear. A part of me knew that she would not remember that her husband had come to visit her tomorrow, 
but I still wanted her to know that any kind of family visits are not allowed so late into the night. The next couple of days, I had the morning shift and completely forgot about Mr. Francine visiting so late. The next time when I had the night shift, I saw Mr. Francine leave his wife's hospital room again late at night. That time, however, I decided to confront him myself. So, I started walking, and the moment I turned into the hallway he had just walked into, it was completely empty. There was no one there. It was weird that an old man could walk so fast. Instead of looking for him, I visited Mrs. Francine in her room. But she was fast asleep. Not wanting to wake her up, I planned on informing the head nurse about the matter in the morning. The next day, I found the head nurse Jennifer grabbing a cup of coffee in the cafeteria. Hey Jen, you got a second? I need to talk to you. Sure, Linda, what is it? So you know Mrs. Francine, the woman who has the corner room, right? Yeah, she is such a sweetheart. Last night when I was on my night shift, her husband came to visit her around 2 a.m., and that is not the first time that it happened. I saw him leave her room at night on my last night shift as well. I tried to confront him myself the second time, but, but he had walked away. Would you mind stepping in? It would be great if you could talk to him and stop the late night shift visits, or at least tell the security at the gate to not let him in so late. As I was talking, Jennifer was sipping her coffee, and her face was growing concerned with every word. Honey, I think you need to take a seat for this. Why, what happened? Do you know how old Mrs. Francine is? No, maybe 90? That woman is 102 years old, the oldest in this hospital, hell, probably in this town. Her husband, Mr. Francine, died 30 years ago. He was 77 or something. I don't know who you saw coming out of her room, but I'm sure it wasn't her husband. Now, I'll get back to work. Oh, and many of Mrs. Francine's relatives live in Europe or in a different state, so none of a relative's visitor. And I'm sure the staff or the security are not letting any outsiders in at night. Jennifer's words stunned me. So instead, I directly went to Mrs. Francine's room. Oh, dearie, you're back. Looked like she was having one of her good days, which meant I could talk to her. Mrs. Francine, do you mind me asking you a few questions? Not at all. Go on. Where is your husband? Oh, Martin. The love of my life. I had five lovely kids with him. Unfortunately, he left me a while ago. He passed away. That information hit me hard, but I continued. So who visits you at night? Visits me at night? No one visits me at night, dearie, except the nurses and doctors. The other night I saw an old man leave your room at around 2 a.m. You told me he was your husband and that he visits you sometimes. To that, she opened the door of her bedside table and pulled out a crumbled picture. It was a black and white picture of a family. She passed the picture to me, and when I looked closer, it was Mrs. Francine standing in the middle, with five little children around her. And beside her stood a tall man. He was Mrs. Francine's husband, Martin. I kept staring at the picture. It must have been taken some time in the 40s, and the more I stared at the man, the more he looked like the younger version of the man who visited Mrs. Francine. That's when it hit me. I had seen a ghost of Mr. Francine on my night shifts. It spooked me so much that I returned the photo to her. Suddenly, Mrs. Francine looked at something behind me and said, I'll see you soon, dear. Now our wait is over. I looked behind me and there was no one there. I left her room shortly, more spooked than ever. 
but her last statement stuck with me. Exactly 24 hours later, she passed in her sleep. I still work in that hospital, and a new patient has moved into her room. Since her passing, I haven't seen that old man during my night shifts. Before taking your leave, I just have one question. Do people visit their loved ones from the beyond?